the church and all, let it be the first of the city of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, today's scripture reading is going to be found in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31 to 41. 46, 46. It reads, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison, and go to visit you? Then the king will reply, I will tell you, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the of, of at least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared by the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me, gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will, they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of at least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment for the righteous, to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's been uh, a while since I've been up here. And I don't know why, Brother Amos, but uh, we've been complaining that Hilltop hasn't been very full. And then all of a sudden today, it's time for me to preach and all of you come home. <laughs> Brother Baxter and Brother Cleo have been giving me stress in the hallway there. Um, most of you know that I speak on a regular basis for work, uh, but I don't ever get nervous. But for some reason, when it's time to speak in front of all of you, my nerves are so you'll forgive me if I'm a bit nervous. I promise, Brother Baxter, I won't speak about technology or anything else <laughs> when I'm up here. Um, but it's a blessing, it's a blessing to, be, to be here today. Over the last couple of weeks, it's, uh, it's been a bit of a difficult time in South Africa. Would you agree? Amen. Um, I was sitting in church last week, we were worshiping in Centurion because we had a wedding that side. And I was sitting in church last week and then a thought came to me and I think I interrupted Brother Justice in the middle of his service and I said, Brother Justice, I'm not sure who's preaching next week but uh, I need you to replace them because um, God's telling me that there's something I need to speak about. So that's what I'm going to try to do today if you don't mind for a moment. Um, as I mentioned, things have been quite difficult the last few weeks. Every day on the news, it seems like somebody else is being kidnapped, somebody's going missing, somebody, somebody's dying some horrific way. And a friend of mine said that it feels like our streets are made out of petrol because the anger, the violence that just comes up, it just happens so instantaneously. And then this last week, I saw that there was a few times where people were marching marching for justice, marching for women, marching for Nigerians, against xenophobia, all kinds of things. So what it left me wondering was, what is social justice? Because it's something that people kept talking about. What is this thing? And what does the, the Bible say about it? 
and what as Christians must we do when these things happen? So I went to the dictionary and I went to the Bible to kind of look at what social justice was. Uh, according to the dictionary, social justice is a political, philosophical, or religious concept that holds that all people should have equal access to health, wealth, well-being, justice, and opportunity. Justice is when we shape rules and conditions for public life, for the common good, and when we promote doing good to keep others accountable and to keep everyone having the same basic rights and conditions. I thought it was interesting, but I didn't think it was enough. So I went to the Bible and I said, what does the Bible say about justice? And the Bible is linked to justice in a lot of different chapters. It's mentioned over and over and over, uh, many times in both the Old and New Testament. It, justice is linked to restitution and repayment. So oftentimes, especially in the Old Testament, when they talk about justice, they're talking about someone making holes and an injustice they've committed. If they've stolen someone's property, they've committed theft or damage, justice is restitution or repayment. Justice is also vindication or vengeance. And this often talks about God and his taking vengeance on oppression, against oppressors on behalf of the oppressed. It's also punishment. You'll know that in the Old Testament, Sometimes justice is referred to as an eye for an eye, right? Where offenders just get what they deserve. If you commit a sin, this is the punishment. Justice is also thought of as mercy in the Bible, where mercy is extended to people who are guilty, people who don't deserve to, let be, to, let, uh, to be let free from punishment. It also refers to forgiveness where justice can mean to forgive, to lift and remove sin and guilt. And I think super importantly is justice is related to reconciliation, where God decides that it's time for a punishment to end and to restore access to him. In, 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 Israel, in, uh, in Jewish culture, it's called shalom, when peace is returned with God, when peace with God is restored. And I think God practices a, uh, a reconciliatory <coughs> justice and love all the time. But for me, when I was reading, and I think English is a very limited language. It doesn't really describe things. You know when we speak in our own native languages and you try to convert things to English, it doesn't sound the same. Um, it's the same in the Bible, all right? I don't think, I wish we all knew Hebrew and Greek, Brother Chris. Uh, because the Bible reads a little bit differently when you read it in its original language. And that's why I always, whenever you, I preach, if you haven't heard me preach before, I always go back to the Greek and the Hebrew. Because English doesn't do our translations justice all the time. So there's two words for justice in the Old Testament. And you'll for, forgive my mispronunciation, but I'm not Hebrew. So there's mishpat and tzaddik. Mishpat and Sadik. Mishpat is in the Old Testament more than 200 times. And this is a basic meaning that says we must treat people equally. It refers to punishment. So if you do something, no matter who you are, what your social status is, Mishpat means that you'll get a just punishment. But it's more than just punishment. It also means giving people justice, giving people their rights. In Deuteronomy 18, it says that priests of the tabernacle should be given a, 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 they should be supported by a, a certain percentage of the people's income. And it's called the priest's mishpat, their, their right, their due. Right? So in our context, contributing to our preacher's salaries, Brother Justice, is a right, it's a justice, it's something that's fair and equal. Amen. Amen. But mishpat is also more than giving people what they do. It's also about protecting and caring for people. So if you look to tzedek, which is the other form of justice in the Bible, it is literally translated to being just. But oftentimes we just translate it to being righteous. We all know about righteousness, right? It's mentioned over and over in the Bible, but that's not the purest sense of that word. Because when we think about righteousness, we think about our personal Righteousness, like our relationship with God, that we're, we're pure people, that we don't commit sin, that 
we have a regular relationship with God that we read our Bible. But tzedek refers to a way you live your life that is just, a way you live your life that treats people with fairness, that makes sure that there's, there's generosity, that there's equality in everything that we do. So when we think about justice, those are the two things that we need to think about. That we need to think about punishment, yes, and, and making things whole, but we need to think about a just life, a fair life, a, a united life that gives everyone access and treatment. Now, because we don't always go to the Old Testament, I thought, let me go to the New Testament and think about what the New Testament says about justice as well. And there's a word in the Greek called dikaios. You'll forgive me as well, Brother Chris. I did all right. Okay. <laughs> all right, I'm just, I was literally just guessing. <laughs> all right? And again, this is mentioned 200 times in the New Testament, dikaios. And again, every single time, all but once, I think, Dikaios is translated to just righteousness, right? That's the only time we see about justice. And I think only in Colossians chapter 4 is it mentioned um, where it talks about right and fair. But every other time it's just immediately translated to righteousness. And the problem with that is that we personalize righteousness. We think that I must be a righteous person, that God must look at me and think and see righteousness. But... Righteousness and justice are connected in the entire Bible. And, and I think if we really want to think about justice, we need to think about Christ's life. Because I think he's a perfect example for what social justice can look like. If you look in the Gospels, Jesus continuously challenged religious authorities, political authorities against injustice. He, he went against everybody in the time. Uh, he would heal people, cast out demons on the Sabbath, he would associate with women, he would associate with fishermen, with tax collectors, lepers, prostitutes. All of these things were for a Jewish person, especially a teacher of the law, and someone considered to be righteous, were very unrighteous behaviors in that time. And I think sometimes we don't think about that when we think about Christ. We think that he was just practicing a message of love and of grace, right, and, and the gospel. But Christ was very particular in challenging society at the time and things that he thought were unjust. There was a prostitute in Luke chapter 7 that he forgave. In, in Luke chapter 15, there was a story of the prodigal son who was welcomed home and rewarded even above and beyond the son who was faithful. And there's constant examples in Christ's teaching and his own actions where he practiced another form of justice, which is mercy. And, and I think that one is something that is always difficult for us to understand and practice in our own lives, mercy and grace. But I think the reason that Christ was able to do this was because of love. <coughs> Without love, we can't practice justice. Without love and the willing to embrace other people, people that have wronged us, people um, that are our enemies, people that don't look like us, people who it's unpopular to support, without our ability to love and embrace those people, we'll never have real justice. Amen. And I think <coughs> the Bible constantly teaches us that God is a God of justice. And the Old Testament talks about it over and over, and we think about this powerful God that just says, yes or no, and if you disagree with me, I'll, 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 I'll smite you down. But I think over and over, God shows that he's concerned and loves the people that are poor and afflicted. He says it over and over in the Bible that he's got a special spot in his heart for people that are treated unjustly. The Bible refers to the fatherless, widows, sojourners, foreigners, people that didn't have a support system. And even in Israeli law, I mean in, in Jewish law rather, uh, the nation of Israel was, was commanded to take care of these people. There was, a, I think Brother Chris or Brother Justice, you preached about it once, there was a practice of gleaning, which said that 
uh, when you were when you were um, harvesting your fields that you would leave a little bit behind. You wouldn't take everything away. And that specifically was to say that widows and foreigners could come through your farms afterwards and still have enough left to eat. And I'd argue that the, the, is the, the, the nation of Israel, the, their failure to do so was one of the reasons God judged them and why they ended up having to leave their land. You know, the scripture that we pointed to today mentions the least of these. And I think over and over and over, both God and His Word and Christ and His action refer to taking care of people that society doesn't care for. So whether we use the term social justice or not, whether we practice social justice or not, I think we are actively engaged in social justice when we take care of people that are in need. Because we're replicating what Christ wants us to do. So I want us to go back to Matthew chapter 25 for a moment and read what it says. Brother Baxter, please, Matthew chapter 25 from verse 31. Because I'd like us to look at what Christ or who Christ says that we need to take care of, who we need to safeguard for. Are you ready? Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. But when the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then shall He sit on the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all the nations, and He shall separate one from another, and the shepherd separated the sheep from the goats. So the scene that he's painting here is that at the end of days, no stand there, brother, just, uh, brother Baxter. I told you I was going, I was going to make you stand there. He was teasing me about must I hold your Bible while you're preaching? Yeah. <laughs> so there he is. Thank you, my brother. I told you I was going to get my my justice. <laughs> So the scene here is pointing to the end of days, right? Where, where Christ is sitting there as judge and he's separating all of humanity, left and right, the sheep and the goats. And what does he say in verse 34? Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry. I was hungry? And you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Here we go. Hungry, thirsty, a stranger, a foreigner, someone needing clothes, someone sick, someone in prison. It's quite black and white, eh? The Christ is saying, these are the least of these. These are the least of these. When you think about these people, and you think about your own behavior, and your own care for people, do you think about these people? Honestly. Because I argue we pass most of them every day, right? Literally at the roads, the robots, we have some feeling in our hearts about them and whether we should help them or not. But literally, these are the people that God says are the least of these. What does it say in verse 37, my brother? Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? And when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked? and clothed ye, and when so we thee seek, or in prison, and come unto thee. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did unto one of these my brethren, even these least you did it unto me. Thank you. I'd argue that when we read the Bible, we also have to put it into our relevant context sometimes. And this entire list of people, the hungry, the poor, you can have a seat, my brother, it's okay. The poor, the stranger, the foreigner, the prisoner, 
Now, this is a great list, but these are the most marginalized people in society at that time. Now, if we put it into today's context and think about our country, our city, just right now, who are the most marginalized people today? Okay. Foreigners, women and children. It's pretty accurate, right? That right now, the way society looks and feels over the last couple of weeks, that these are the most marginalized people, certainly, that we're seeing today. These are the people that literally need our protection. As I mentioned, God has a special concern for the people that are poor, the people that are in need. He expects us over and over and over to take care for these people. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong in the family of believers. Over and over, God tells us that we need to take care of everyone that is around us. And I think sometimes when we think about serving others, when we think about benevolence, when we think about doing good for people, we think that it's for their benefit. Right? We think when we take care of the poor, we're taking care of them for them. But here, Christ literally says that whatever you did for these, the least of these, you did for me. So it's not actually about those people. That our service to everybody else is actually part of our service to Christ. It's part of his instruction. It's part of what we're supposed to do. So I think that social justice, biblical justice, this Christ-like justice is, requires us to take action and requires us to think about the actions of Christ. I think as Christians we need to recognize that our society has people that are marginalized, that has people that face danger, people that are going through oppression, people that have problems. And often I think that we have this kind of spiritual laziness that says it's not our problem. That says that, like it's not us, it's not happening here at Hilltop, right? We're okay. And the government will take care of this, or the police will take care of this, or some NGO will take care of this. And I think when we remove ourselves from the context that society is in, we're actually doing a disservice because Christ didn't remove himself from the context of his society. He, he was quite complex, he was quite revolutionary if you really think about it. I mean, Christ intentionally, purposefully, actually went out of his way to address specific issues. Uh, and I think we just think that Christ was like just preaching this universal message of, of salvation, and, but he was actually addressing racial issues, societal issues, political issues. He was helping people that were oppressed. Uh, I don't think Christ, there's a scripture of him particularly addressing what the role of women were in society, but he did that through his support of women, the way he treated women, he included women, he befriended them, he forgave them, uh, and he gave them dignity that wasn't like Jewish tradition at the time. He did the same thing for other social outcasts, lepers, the blind, the demonized, the poor, uh, prostitutes, tax collectors, these are all people that during that time a religious person would not associate with at all. And Christ went out of his way to kind of show them humanity, to kind of correct the injustice that was happening to them. He did the same thing with Samaritans and Gentiles. That was a different group of people. That was a racial group that Jews did not associate with, that they thought were unclean people. And Christ went as far as to praise them in his teaching. He healed people on the Sabbath. He, I mean, something that religious leaders at the time would say, no ways, would say, we wouldn't do those things. So I think when we look at, when we think about social justice, sometimes we think about these things and we think that they're worldly things, that they're secular things, that they're, they're liberal things, um, because they're difficult to have conversations about. They make us uncomfortable. But I think that Christ deeply cared about all the social issues that were around him. He showed that through his ministry, that Samaritan lives mattered, that women's lives mattered, that, that Jewish lives mattered, that, that lepers' lives mattered, right? And I'm, I'm not going to say all lives mattered, but that's, that's what he was, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he, he didn't just say, like, come. He's like, let me actually go and do these things for the people 
that are in need. So I think when we involve ourselves with the social issues that are happening uh, around us, we're also being Christ-like. Because I think sometimes we think that these things go against the gospel and what the gospel is advancing. I think that when we serve the people that are in need, that's part of the gospel. That's part of our work. Uh, I've heard Christians quote Galatians 3.28 in, uh, in, uh, in an attempt to say that we're all equal. And Galatians 3.28 says, There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male or female, that you're all one in Christ Jesus. And we say that nothing else matters beyond our faith in Christ. And that's quite important. But I think by Paul, by God mentioning these specific groups of people, these races, these ethnicities, these genders, I think he's saying that they do actually matter. That there's something happening, that people are treated differently, that people have different rights, that even have different privileges, disadvantages, they've got different social value. So I think when we, when we see different people, it's to say, yes, we're equal in Christ's love, but that people are unequal in society, and there's something that we must do about it. And when we participate in social justice, it's not because the media tells us to, it's not because it's trending on Twitter, it's not because... Um, it's liberal or secular. It's because that's part of our walk with Christ. It's because Christ lived a life of justice, of empowerment, of love. And I think that even though Christ loves everybody, he went out of his way to inten intentionally help specific groups of people. And these were people that were alienated, these were people that were mistreated, these were people that were facing injustice. Does that make sense? I think it's, I think it's, 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 quite, it's quite incredible. Like Christ loved everybody, but over and over in his ministry, he's like, let me take care of these kind of people. And I think we can't discount that when we think about our own walk, and we think about how we action our own faith. That we can't sleep on this issue, that when we... We can't negate that there's issues going on, and we can't negate that people are going through things and the people around us have different hardships. I think when we want to know how to care for foreigners, we look at the Bible. When we want to understand how to think about justice and human justice, we think about God's example of justice. When we want to know how to treat the rest of the world, we look at how Christ treated the world. When we want to know how to love, we look at Christ's sacrificial, unconditional love. And those are our examples. That's the litmus test for how we're supposed to behave and how we're supposed to treat those around us. Because I've read so many social media statuses this last couple of weeks, and, and Christians in particular are just saying, oh, this is so horrible. And you know what? Jesus, maybe it's time for you to come back, because why would people do these things? And that's all we said. And for me, I don't think that's Christ-like. I think if Christ was here today... I don't think he would just be on Facebook saying, these things are horrible, these things are bad. I think Christ would be there with the people that were afflicted and not only helping them, but preaching the gospel as well. So I'm not saying this to say that our only path as Christians and our only responsibility is to just take care of other people. We're still supposed to be here to preach the gospel. But part of the gospel message is love and care and support, especially for those that are vulnerable. I want us to read, uh, turn our Bibles to, to John chapter 13. Verse chapter, chapter 13, verse 34. Brother Baxter, are you here? John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one love another. Love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, and if you have love for one another. Love one another. It's three times in, a, in like one section. We know that in, when we're reading the Bible and when we're seeing what's important in the Bible, repetition is a key thing. And Christ says, right here, a commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And when you love one another, everyone will see that you're my disciple. Three times, 
love one another. So I ask you today, church, that as you walk around, as you see people, you must love one another. Like, it's a simple command, and it's a commandment. It's something that God doesn't suggest. He mandates. He says, this is something that you must do. It's in black and white. It's not an opinion. It's not supposed to be comfortable. It's not supposed to be easy. He just continues to say, love one another. And by loving one another, people will know that you're mine. It's that simple. So when you walk out of here today, even here in this room, we just have to love one another. And love is an action. It's not a feeling merely that says, oh, I just love everybody. And it's airy-fairy. Love is it's followed by action. All right? Trust me, if you're married, you can't just say, I love you. All right? It's followed by action. But anyways, right? you, you got to do something with it. you got to prove that you got to make some extra comments, Sister Nail, that you have to do something to say, no, I can see that you love me. So by loving one another, we all have to take action with what's happening around us. Amen. 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 The last thing I want to say is that we're not immune just because we're the church. Right? I could ask all the sisters in the room, right, that if you have been abused, that if you've been harassed, that if you've been sexually assaulted, raise your hand. I could ask them to do so. But I don't want to because I'm scared that it would be everybody in this room. That's reality, right? A foreigner, if you're a foreigner, to say that you've been harassed, exposed because you're a foreigner, like don't let this accent fool you. There's still xenophobia that comes here, right? It's the same. So we're not immune just because we're here at Hilltop and we all get along. These things are happening right here as we speak. I just have one last scripture that I want us to go to. Brother Baxter, I want us to go to James, the book of James, chapter 1. And then I'm going to sit down. James, chapter 1, verse 27. James, chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and our Father is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Another version says that the religion that God our Father accepts is pure, as pure and faultless. So the religion that God loves is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Again, it's quite black and white, right? That the religion, the practice, because that's what religion is, it's practice, the day to day, that God loves is tied to us looking after those who are distressed. I just want us to go back to the least of these as I sit down. Brother Baxter has a different version than I. It says, for when I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat, when I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink, when I was a stranger and you did not invite me in, I needed clothes and you did not clothe me, I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me, and they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or needing clothes or sick in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And I've got another version here. It says, whatever you failed to do for one of my brothers or sisters, no matter how unimportant they seemed. How's that, eh? You failed to do for me. So one day, church, Christ is going to be in front of you. And he's going to be pointing to women and children and foreigners and the other most marginalized people in society. And he's going to ask you, what did you do for me? I'd just like us to think about how we're going to be able to respond. Amen. Amen. Amen.